In honor of the Sony Walkman's 40th anniversary this year, 2019, I thought I'd make a video about my Minidisc Walkmans. I have two and one Panasonic Minidisc player. This video will not be a comprehensive technical tutorial. I just want to show my collection and take a trip down memory lane and introduce this format to people who aren't familiar with it. I am not an authority on this subject, just a regular person who personally owned and loved this format back in the day. This is a very long video. There will be timestamps in the description below the video if you want to skip ahead to the specific topic you want to see. The anniversary is for the very first Walkman, whose medium is the cassette tape. Then came the CD Walkman years after, and now the various digital MP3 players that Sony is selling under the Walkman branding. Not many people have heard of the Minidisc Walkmans because they came of age at an awkward time. This was invented in 1992 according to Wikipedia. By widespread I mean ads in popular magazines, mainstream shops selling blank discs, and recorders and players. Not just specialty hi-fi shops. Mainstream enough for regular people to be curious about and want to buy. Not just your rich uncle who's the first adopter of obscure tech. At the time though, regular people were pretty happy with their CD Walkmans for portable use, despite a few issues like skipping. The latter-day anti-skip tech was pretty decent enough. CD Walkmans from Sony and other non-Walkman branded portable CD players were mainstream enough during that era that prices were very affordable, quality was good, and it was already very easy to burn discs, even MP3 CDs, the kind where the actual MP3 files were recorded as data and you can have hundreds of tracks in one disc, and even read the titles on your CD player, not just track 01, track 02, and so on. And for those who want a more robust choice, the more primitive MP3 players were starting to come out in the market. Apple launched the very first click wheel iPod in 2001. It was still a very primitive iPod back then. For starters, it only worked with Mac computers, but it was nicer than the other primitive MP3 players because iTunes offered a neat way to organize your songs in the player, into playlists and albums, not just a list of songs you play from start to finish, or at most a shuffle. I got my first Minidisc Walkman that year. I didn't have a Mac, so I didn't even consider buying that very first iPod. At that time, the iPod was just one portable music device option out of many. Who knew it would be the de facto method of consuming music on the go and totally dominate it for the succeeding decade, at least until the rise of smartphones and internet-connected portable devices and streaming. Anyway, I paid just as much for this Sony MZR900 as that very first iPod cost. Who would have known then though that this kind of portable player, the kind that takes hardware media, whether discs or a tape, was already on its last legs? One benefit of the Minidisc format over the dominant portable music format of the time, the CD, is that it's smaller and it doesn't skip if you move around with it. But this costs a lot compared to CD players, whose prices have stabilized and were very affordable by the late 90s, early 2000s. Blank CDs too were very cheap by then. Another benefit is that the actual disc is more robust, protected by a hard shell plastic over the easily scratchable backs of CDs. Store-bought minidisc albums were also hard to come by and were also expensive, while CDs were plentiful, have nice art, and were available in mainstream stores and were affordable. Lastly, portable CD players anti-skip shockproof technology have gotten pretty good by then that you could lug it around in a backpack during your commute without much skipping. If you really wanted to jog or run or bike with your music, these primitive gum stick MP3 players, or even the very first iPod, or other primitive MP3 players, were good enough and lightweight enough to bring along during sports. Minidisc players were not just expensive because Sony wanted to rip you off though. They were well-engineered hardware marvels. And many weren't just simple players but were also recorders. For the simple reason I mentioned above, store-bought discs were hard to come by and the idea is you would be recording your own audio collection into this anyway. Kind of like a blank CD mp3 compilation or mp3 player alternative. A device that does double duty as a recorder and a player is necessarily going to be more complex than a simple player. Even during the cassette Walkman heyday, we were talking about cassette players, not recorders. You usually purchased store-bought tapes, or if you wanted to record your own, you used a boombox or a tape deck. Usually only reporters had a portable cassette player that did double duty as a recorder that has auxiliary inputs and microphone inputs. 
Everything I said is from my personal observations from living in that era and actually owning these devices. If you want more technical details and information about its history, just check out its Wikipedia entry or minidisc.org. Which brings me to the very first player recorder of this video, the Sony MZR900. This was introduced in the year 2000 and I got it in third quarter 2001. This is the box, kind of yellowed now. I knew being a hoarder would come in handy someday. It comes with an AC adapter brick, an inline remote control to which you plug in your earphones, a rechargeable nickel metal hydride battery, and the minidisc recorder itself. The recorder player itself looks very nice, even until now, the material feels very premium. Not cheap in plastic, it's full of buttons, something we don't see in today's glass lab world where everything is an app on a touchscreen. The build quality is excellent, it feels like the type of device made to last a lifetime, even if the tech is antiquated already. The actual hardware is still a lovely piece of art. It's got the silvery, metallic finish that feels smooth, yet with just a bit of friction so it's not slippery. The paint job is matte, not a gaudy, shiny, metallic object. The only shiny bits are the little buttons. Speaking of the little buttons, it's been over a decade since I last used this, so I admit I had to reread the user manual before making this video. I lost the actual paper manual already, but thankfully found a copy online on Manual's library. I'll link to it in the description below. The user manual is yet another throwback. You don't see such thick explanation booklets anymore nowadays for consumer tech, phones, even 2019 era audio players, and there's a mini revival even in the age of streaming of audio players that play uncompressed digital files, not just mp3s, standalone basic mp3 players, etc. They all just give you a thin folded quick start guide and a link to a website to download a program or an app. So many pages and I read them all. And then I read the user manual for this blue unit, which I'll talk about later, but back to this silver MZR900. You know when I said that it was meant to last a lifetime, it probably could've. The battery isn't entombed in the device unlike modern devices. The gumstick rechargeable batteries have since melted over the years, but I was able to buy replacement ones on eBay. For the longest time, it was so hard for me to find, that's why I didn't think of making this video until recently. Apparently, many e-cigarettes share the same rechargeable battery form factor. Thank God for the new trend of smoking USB sticks instead of Marlboro. There are two things wrong with this MZR900. The battery door doesn't lock in place anymore, and the open button mechanism is permanently recessed. I used this heavily for five years. It's understandable that there would be such wear and tear. It's also not technically a difficult thing to fix, it's just the physical, mechanical wear and tear. It's not like fixing iPhone home buttons where you have to open up the entire face and who knows, end up damaging stuff inside. The thing is, this device is relatively unknown nowadays, I wouldn't know who to go to to fix it. Also, the next two minidisc players I have, these two blue ones, fix this issue by using a slider mechanism instead of a push button one that ends up permanently recessed if you depress it too often. Kind of like physical home buttons and iPhones. So that's the top of this device, the open button that opens the MD player when pressed. You close it by simply snapping it shut. Next, the bottom of the device has the yellow Sony charging port and two pins connect to the included external charging accessory that takes AA batteries. The middle part is a screw hole for locking in the accessory. The left side has the battery door and a jog lever knob. It is not a scroll wheel. You rock it up and down to run through menu options and then push inwards to enter or select. The right side is the same lever that operates the same way. While the one on the left runs through the menu, the one on the right runs or moves through tracks. Move it up to go to the next track as the printed icon indicates and you move it down to go back to the previous track. Pushing it in plays the selection as the universal triangle play icon indicates. The play icon isn't printed, but is an actual silvery metal that they put inside a recessed piece of the face. It's not even just embossed. The triangle on the upper left is a hollow carved out triangle pointing downwards, indicating the direction you open the MD player. My latter model no longer has this over-designed feature, instead opting for a simple white painted indicator. This LCD screen displays the track name, playtime, and various other information. Just refer to the user manual screenshot for details. These are the volume buttons. I'll skip the next two for now. This is the slider that triggers recording. This pauses both playback and recording. This stops and also begins charging your rechargeable battery. Now for this button. 
With regular cassette tapes, when you record audio into it that stop recording, you can pick up where you left off the next time you want to record. The tape just stops at the spot where you stopped recording. But with MDs, you won't know where the end of the last recording is. This button, End Search, goes to the very end of the minidisc, allowing you to record audio with a peace of mind that you're not overwriting a previous track. Of course, if you want to overwrite something, you can just rewind to that spot and overwrite it. Rec mode allows you to choose whether you want to record near CD quality audio into the MD. It doesn't care if your source is compressed or not, whether your source is an MP3 or a compressed streaming song or the radio. The compressed part is in the destination, this minidisc. That's the first option, near CD quality standard format. It also allows you to record into the MDLP format. LP stands for long play. It compresses the audio in the minidisc. The less compressed MDLP mode fits about two CDs worth of songs into one MD. It's called LP2. And the even more compressed MDLP mode called LP4 fits about four CDs worth of songs into one MD, as you can see in the little sticker here. The Sony is in raised lettering and there are other words that are engraved into the device too, like here on the right. The labels for earphone, line out, mic input, and line in. You don't see this kind of attention to detail anymore in consumer tech. The earphone line out looks unusual because you can also opt to plug the bundled inline remote there and then plug your earphone into the inline remote. You can also plug your speakers into this as long as it is a 3.5 millimeter jack. The microphone input can take any mini microphone that's self-powered, as the label says. It also has a dedicated line input for recording from external audio sources, as long as you have the 3.5 millimeter jack to plug into the MD recorder and whatever is on the other end of the cable that goes into your source, whether a radio, TV, boombox, computer line out, phone, another MD, cassette deck, etc. The inline remote mirrors nearly all the same functions of the controls on the device, so you can keep the MD player tucked into your pocket or bag and just use the inline remote to choose songs, read track titles, and so on. You can also use this inline remote to name and rename tracks that you recorded if you want, so you're not just reading track 01, track 02, and so on. You rotate this little jog wheel to select letters. It's a tedious process. Just read the screenshot for details. I can't do a live demo as my unit doesn't turn on anymore. Seeing song titles and artist names is important to me, so I remember tediously labeling tracks with this little jog wheel for hours on end back in the day. This is something called CD joint text function, where if you use an optical digital audio cable connected to a Sony Discman that supports CD joint text and play a CD that has CD joint text where the artist name and song titles are labeled with that technology, the titles will get transferred automatically into the MD without any manual relabeling effort on your part needed. But you heard what I said, right? It required all these things that were very uncommon. You record into this player in real time, basically. You sit and wait while your source plays out the audio, and the recorder records the audio as it's being played. If you activate Record Synchro, it will only start recording once your source starts producing sound. That's nice because it's not like cassette tape days when you have to simultaneously press play in the source audio and the destination cassette recorder. The manual speaks of a digital input if you use an optical cable, but that's not digital in the way you think of like moving files with a USB cable. It's digital in the sense of sending digital signals the way say on TVs, HDMI sends digital signals versus RCA cables. If you use a regular analog 3.5 millimeter audio cable to record, it can auto detect gaps of silence in between tracks in your source audio and make the succeeding audio a separate track on your MD. That way, during playback, you can skip to the next track with just one click the way you do on a CD instead of tediously fast forwarding, playing to see if that's the right song, then fast forwarding a bit more to go to the next track you want and repeating it when you want to rewind. Although in some latter higher-end car cassette players, I notice they can also auto-detect gaps of silence in store-bought cassette tapes and fast-forward skip to the next track. But that wasn't very common. Sometimes it doesn't auto-detect the gaps between songs though, because sometimes there's a hiss or something in the source. When you use the digital optical cable and record from a digital source like a CD, it can auto-detect the gap better and make tracks with less error, although it's still not foolproof. 
That's where this last button on the device comes in, the T mark button. You click it to manually place track marks between songs. As I mentioned, you can skip to the next song, skip back to the previous song without rewinding and waiting if your track marks are all set up. Whether manually with this T mark button or the auto detection the recorder did, you can fast forward or rewind also if you don't have track marks set up or you just want to move ahead or go back to a specific point in an audio track. There are also some more playback options I won't go into. You can just see the manual for that, like 2 times speed playback or slow down playback. And you can also program a specific sequence, kind of like a playlist. You can also bookmark parts of the audio to go back to. I have never used these options, but it's popular among language learners who use these devices. You can save specific settings into each disk, like this disk. You can program a specific sequence or want it to repeat or want it to shuffle at random. You can save specific preferences into each disk. This blue one is my second MD recorder player. It's a Sony MZ-N910. Released in 2003, I got it in 2005 or 2006. It's slightly heavier than the silver one but has the same built-to-last build quality. The same very premium feel, the same satiny matte feel with a slight friction for a good grip on it. The paint job may be blue but it's not cheap looking or plastic or glossy. I got this secondhand in Taiwan. It retailed for a similar price as the MZR900 which cost around the same price as the original iPod in 2001. The recording functionality is similar to the first unit. You can also seek the end of the last recorded track with this end search button. It also has a T mark button for manually segmenting a piece of recorded audio into separate tracks. You can also bookmark parts of the audio to go back to, just like the first device. Just like the MZR900, you also get to choose between standard play, near CD quality, and two levels of compression of long play, LP2 and LP4 modes using MDLP. The more compressed, the more tracks you can fit into an MD. Just watch the first part for more detailed explanations of these buttons. Just like the first, you also get an inline remote which mirrors the functionality of the device, allowing you to keep it out of the way while clipping the remote to your shirt for easy access. You can plug in either earphones or speakers into it as long as it has a 3.5mm jack. And just like the first, you can also manually label and rename tracks with this jog wheel, so you don't have to scroll through track 01, track 02, and so on. You also record in real time, just like I explained for the first MD recorder. But this model has a newer trick up its sleeve. The N in this model name of MZN910 stands for NetMD and it allows you to transfer digital files via a mini USB, note, not micro, mini USB cable and Sony software. The way you can transfer digital audio files to an iPod with iTunes. The R in the R900 model earlier denotes it as being a recorder R. And E stands for playback-only models, for example, the MZ-E909 in the Sony MD lineup. The USB cable also has a ferrite bead or ferrite choke that suppresses high-frequency noise in electronic circuits. Yes, I read that from Wikipedia. I just thought it was noteworthy that Sony cared enough about audio quality to include that in their cables. iPods just came with generic naked USB cables. That way... You don't have to sit in real time for hours, manually clicking key mark to make track spacings when it doesn't auto-detect gaps of silence. The Sony software was a piece of crap though and I always had issues with it. It's called Sonic Stage and with all the hassle required to set up and get running, I might as well just sit and let my MD recorder record in real time. I'm not getting into its details, you can just try it out if you're a masochist. I just wanted to give you an overview of the features and what's possible. The user manual has more detailed instructions in the software and the transfer process. Of course, during the times when it would work, it was a godsend compared to real-time recording. I wouldn't have to get carpal tunnel twisting this little jog wheel for hours manually labeling tracks for one, and you can have a bunch of tracks ready to go in a disc within half an hour or less, instead of sitting in real time for anywhere from an hour to four. You can also make folders known as groups to organize your songs, especially if you use the compressed recording modes of LP2 or LP4. There may be 50 or 100 songs in there. You can sort them into groups of your own making, by artist or whatever. It doesn't auto-sort by artist, FYI. So you have to be the one to organize the tracks the way you want to into folders. So that's the recording part. Playback is also similar to the first device. Nothing new, standard stuff. Skip track, previous track, all there as long as the track spacings are active. You can also manually fast forward and rewind, play, pause, stop. 
Still as the arcane features like sped up playing, slow down playing, bookmarks, program a specific sequence, kind of like a playlist, just see the manual for more. If you click the charge button, it charges your rechargeable gum stick nickel metal hydride, drawing power from the wall outlet. It also has this external charger accessory that takes AA batteries that extends its battery life. There is only a jog lever knob thing on one side at this time. You operate the menu with a four-way directional button, clicking the middle to select. My final MD player is also blue. This is a Panasonic SJ MJ10. This was released in 2001 and I got it in 2005 or 2006. This is a much cheaper device, which I also got secondhand in Taiwan like the MZ N910. It's a simple player. It doesn't have a recorder feature. I guess Panasonic figured that by the mid-2000s, the format has sufficiently matured that you probably have your own recorder or a deck that you recorded audio into blanks to, or maybe even scored some store-bought MDs. Because remember, I mentioned that in the early days of this format, they didn't really sell these cheaper playback-only devices, mostly the more expensive recorder-player combos for the reasons that I also explained already. The finish and build quality also felt cheaper than the first two. It's also lighter, and the paint job looks more cheap and shiny. But yeah, it's alright. It's cheap. The icons are standard and self-explanatory. Play, pause, skip track, previous track. You can also fast forward or rewind to specific points. Seeking tracks also work if you recorded track marks correctly in your MD. This also comes with an inline remote and even with an interchangeable faceplate. You can plug in any earphone, headphone, speak that has a 3.5mm jack. It also uses the same style of removable and rechargeable gumstick nickel metal hydride battery as the first two that I showed. In the late 2000s, Sony updated the minidisc format with a high MD. It's not backwards compatible with these MD players. The high MD disc has a similar physical appearance and dimensions, but it can record a lot more data. And high MD recorders are similar to NetMD in that you can directly transfer digital audio files to the high MD device with their Sonic Stage software and a mini USB cable. There's also a Type R and a Type S segmentation during the latter days. I don't remember the difference anymore. I didn't buy that one anymore because I was over MDs and over being a masochist by then. I had started using MP3 players. Now let's talk about the media. It looks like a shrunken down floppy disk but with a sturdier case. The internal disk is optical media, like a CD, not the black filmy material of floppy disks. Some can fit 74 minutes of songs and some can fit 80 minutes of songs in standard mode. That's near CD quality. You can fit more in LP2 and LP4 modes. I discussed this earlier. Check the timestamps to go back to that point. These are all my MDs. I made a lot of mixtapes on them, or mix mini discs to be precise. I still have a lot of unrecorded blanks here because I kept thinking I needed to save blanks since they weren't as cheap as blank tapes. So sometimes I'd overwrite a previously recorded mixtape MD. Little did I know that I won't even use this format for 10 years, ha ha ha. I bought all these blanks in Taiwan. MDs made bigger inroads there in the mid 2000s than back home in the Philippines. Like these two sets that even came with vertical holders. I also have these two MD carrying cases that were made specifically with minidisc dimensions in mind. Also the soft pouch that's made for MD players. These two players still work after I bought these replacement batteries. The silver one, the very first one I had, it doesn't work anymore because the open button is already broken. These two use sliders, more durable. My first generation iPod Touch still works fine, but its battery is nearly dead. It only lasts 5 minutes unplugged, tsk tsk But it's not easy to revive because its lithium-ion battery is entombed in the device. I know you can buy replacements and perform surgery on the device, but you shouldn't have to do that to keep a perfectly okay device working. Whereas these devices, they don't become expensive door stops or electronic waste just because the battery is dead, because they're meant to be interchangeable. They're not disposable batteries either since they're rechargeable. You can easily modernize these devices by making them Bluetooth capable by plugging in a 3.5mm audio cable in their line out port and connecting that to a Bluetooth transmitter. Your Bluetooth player can then play music from your MD player. My AC adapter seemed dead when I last tried them a few years back, before I was able to buy the replacement nickel metal hydride batteries. I forgot that they run on the external AA accessories, although battery life is much shorter. You can't find replacement rechargeable ones. But like I said, with the proliferation of e-cigarettes and their usage of this battery format, it's easy and cheap again to buy replacements. That's why I was able to buy on eBay. 
I bought replacement AC adapters too. You can buy any generic one. Just pick those with multiple heads as Sony uses this tiny pin one usually marked yellow and Panasonic has a different one. It doesn't matter what maximum ampere you buy but you should reach at least the minimum amount listed in the original brick. The higher amps the more expensive. You should get the ones that let you switch voltages. You can toggle them to match the voltage on the original adapter like so. Here are some old minidisc photos of mine from back in the day and I'll link to my Flickr album with the photos below. Most were taken 2005 to 2006. I also have a minidisc group on Flickr. I'll link to it in the description. Feel free to join and add your MD photos. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed this very long video. What do you think of MDs? How do you compare them compared to cassettes or CDs? Would you want to buy one? Which of my three minidisc player recorders do you like best? Please comment below. Thanks so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it. See you next video.